Okay, so the vascular territories. This is your anatomy review. Anybody want to skip the anatomy? All right. So anatomy review. So this, you know, some of you it's been like six years, but we're gonna go. We're just gonna do a quick review on the anatomy and the flow of blood to the brain, right? Because that's going to feed a specific area of the brain. If you already know what the anterior super artery feeds right now, you're you're ahead of the game, right? But otherwise, like in yellow right here, I've color coded them for you. So yellow is the MCA or the middle cerebral artery, right? Middle cerebral artery is a artery that feeds this portion of the brain. Remember the homunculus? Or you already kind of have PTSD about it, it's out of your brain now. All right, so the homunculus is laid across that, this, um, this gyrus right here, this post-central or pre-central gyrus, and it's going to be, if that MCA territory is blocked, that area of the homunculus is gonna be, is gonna be blocked also. What area was that that was on this lower portion here? There was a face there, there was arms there, right? And there was a tongue there. So they have dysarthria, they have lack of uh, function of which arm? Well, this is the left motor function, motor part of the brain, right? The left MCA gets blocked. Which one, the right or the left will get, will get affected? The contralateral side was the, was the correct answer. So the contralateral arm or the contralateral um, right arm if the left MCA was affected, okay? So that is the reason why we learned the distribution of the blood, right? So the left MCA feeds this portion of the, the brain, so we get those symptoms, right? The ACA is in blue here. ACA feeds this inner portion of the, of the brain, right? And that inner portion, if you look back at the homunculus, it feeds the genitalia, so you get incontinence, it feeds the legs, so they can't walk good. And also, if you kind of look at it from top down, it's also feeding a little bit of the, of the frontal lobe, right? So we, we kind of slice the brain the other way. And now we have the frontal lobe is now being affected. And what's the frontal lobe responsible for? It's for executive function. What the heck does executive function mean? They can't be a CEO? That means they are, they have a lack of inhibition, right? All of a sudden, grandma's taking her shirt off. So what are you doing, grandma? Don't put that back on, right? Just take, take it right back off, right? So they, and they're in constant, what's going on? I got, I got to change, right? And they're going to try to get up to move and they just, they fall over, right? Because they have a taxic gait. Sorry, your feet weren't there, right? All right, so that is a, those are symptoms of a ACA stroke, right? So our other arteries, we have to, I'm gonna give you four arteries to know. So ACA, PCA, sorry, ACA, MCA, and a PCA stroke. That's the posterior uh, cerebral artery. So the PCA, posterior, meaning it feeds the what half? The front or the back? The back half, right? So posterior is posterior, right? So it feeds these, these little areas right here. It's like, I don't know that one yet. Well, those, there's some, you're gonna start talking about the uh, occipital lobe is gonna be affected, right? This is not green, unfortunately, but here's the PCA back here. It's feeding the occipital lobe. Now, occipital lobe is responsible for what? For vision, right? So probably have some vision problems, right? And then also it starts uh, affecting the thalamus. And we talked about the thalamus a little bit. The thalamus is the switchboard operator. It's what takes a signal from that's incoming or outgoing and it puts it down the right track, right? So this PCA area can be affected and it can have a thalamic symptom. So what the hell is the, thal what the, hell, what the thalamic, so thalamic symptom, right? So you're gonna have a, uh, that, that whole side of the body is not gonna work. It's not gonna receive any signals. It's not gonna deliver any signals, right? To, that part, to the right part of the brain. All right, we have a slide dedicated to each one of these, so we'll go into more detail. But then the last one is the basilar artery, right? So the basilar artery is in red because it's pretty serious. The basilar artery is feeding the base of the brain. And what's at the base of the brain? Cerebellum's there. So you got some balance problems probably. What else is the base of the brain? The brainstem. Brainstem is pretty important, right? Like what's, what goes on in the brainstem? Breathing, right? Breathing problems. It's the control of your autonomic nervous system. It controls your, your heart rate, controls your respiratory rate. And there's a lot of, oh no, cranial nerves that get affected as well. We will go over the cranial nerves because the cranial nerves get affected for each one of these neuro diseases we talk about. So all the neuro diseases have a dysfunction of the cranial nerves in some fashion, right? So we'll, we'll, get, we'll repeat ourselves a couple times about cranial nerves to get you more acclimated, okay? And other, not so much an artery, but the circular willis, not so much like an arterial, it doesn't like perfuse like a specific area of the brain, but the circular willis is like a roundabout and it's a, a way to perfuse the part of the brain that's not getting perfused, right? It's a, around it, it's a way to, to get around a blockage, right? It's, a, it's for collateral circulation, right? So if you have blockage on, let's say, right here, we can go all around and 
go around that blockage if we need to. And we have two forms of circulation going into our brain, an anterior and a posterior. So if, what if our carotid is blocked, right? Is the game over? No, we have a posterior circulation, vertebral artery, that goes up to the basilar artery, and then now we're in the circle of Willis. And now we can feed the rest of the brain the blood that we need. Okay, so that's the point of the circular willis is that it can provide collateral circulation for when an artery is down. Okay, so that's the idea. And also, unfortunately, circular willis gets affected by hypertension. It's a area of, of, low, of high pressure and it can pop, right, with a aneurysmal bleed. And that will cause an ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke if you have an aneurysm that pops. Be a hemorrhagic stroke, right? So it can fe it's fed by the posterior circulation, whoop, right there, and the anterior, so the anterior circulation and the posterior circulation. So you can see here we got the carotids, which we're used to, or the carotids come and feed the front half of our brain, land in the circle of Willis, and then we have the vertebral arteries that leave off our subclavian, and those are going to feed the back half of the brain. Okay, so we'll talk about these different arteries in more detail. All right, so blue for ACA. So ACA is our anterior cerebral artery. So the anterior cerebral artery feeds the inner portion of our, let's change our color to blue, feeds the inner portion of our homunculus. And what's our homunculus part right there? That's our legs, right? And also what, you got some incontinence as well. And if we were to slice in half the other way, it feeds the frontal lobe, right? So we got frontal lobe problems, we got walking problems, and we got incontinence problems, right? That's called wet, wild, and wacky, right? So wet, they are incontinent. Wild, they have inhibi disinhibi disinhibition. And they are also wacky, but they are also wacky gait, you could say, right? They don't have a great gait, right? Their legs are affected. They're contralateral or ipsilateral legs. It's contra or ipsa. Which one? Contra, right? The reason being is because it came down from this side of the brain, and it did what? It decussated, right? Below the medulla, and then came out the spinal cord right there to our legs, right? So it's gonna affect the contralateral side. If I have a left ACA stroke, I have right contralateral leg or arm paresis. Which one? Leg, right? So the leg, why is it not the arm? Because the ACA does not feed the arm. The ACA uh, feeds only the uh, the legs and the genitalia and such, and pizzies, okay? So a little mnemonic you can have, a little guy you can draw is this guy right here, and we're going to build him first, so we got the ACA. And you can put a little, another A in the, in the bladder as well, right? It causes incontinence and also leg problems, right? And also they're a little bit wacky, so you can put a little A hat on top of them if you want to, okay? So it causes wet, wild, and wacky. They're incontinent, they got disinhibition, and they got impaired judgment, right? And also they kind of don't want to move as well. They get very, very nervous, not nervous, but like they don't have their urge to move, right? It's called abulia, right? It's like abonigas, but abulia, right? So it's a, abulia is where you have a inability to want to move, okay? And they have gait apraxia. They know how to walk, but when they walk, they walk like a toddler. They don't really know, it doesn't look like they know how to walk. Apraxia means they're not doing something they should know how to do, okay? So they have contralateral feet or leg paresis. What about the sensation? Will that be affected? Yeah, it's, it's, it's that ACA doesn't feed just the gyrus, um, one, one gyrus. It feeds the whole thing right here. That whole area, um, both the, both the presential and postcentral gyrus. So it affects the homunculus for sensation and it affects the homunculus for motor, right? So can they feel their leg? No, they cannot feel the contralateral leg. So that's called what? You can't feel. It's called being callous. Or no, I'm kidding. It's called being either paresthesia first, and then maybe anesthesia will happen next. Okay? So that's the ACA artery, the anterior cerebral artery. When you have an ACA stroke, whether it be ischemic or hemorrhagic, that's going to lead to a uh, findings of wet, wild, and wacky. Right? They're going to be incontinent. They're going to be uh, abulius or abulius, but also they're going to be have an impaired gait, impaired, and then also the contralateral leg is not going to be able to feel or move. All right, so the MCA stroke it used to be called just the FAST score, and it got upgraded to the BFAST to include the next slide, 
but fast used to be what it was for like 15 years. Fast meaning face, arms, and speech. Hi, Byron. How are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. <laughs> what are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked with the people for them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. They'll save in the moment. He'll have water very soon for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to we get to We will soar it right here and they'll save their hands right there for and, them. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> the iPad. All right, so he has a word salad. So word salad means he articulates great, but he's unable to find the right words. He might find words that are nearby. Like he says, oh, it's really cold outside. He might say the polar bear outside or the polar bear uh, out of house, right? So he's using words that are close to the right word, right meaning, but it's not, it's a salad of different words that make no sense, right? So the speech is, impaired and it depends on the area like i said the wear keys area is for words right and you got weird salad when you have wear keys encephalopathy right or wear encephalopathy wear keys area is damaged right the broke is area is broken speech which you probably heard patients that are unable to speak uh, clearly right they have the words are broken right they cannot speak good so is that called a receptive aphasia or an expressive aphasia they can't speak it's called an expressive aphasia, right? And it can be uh, global, but these, those are our two most common examples of aphasia, Broca's and Wernicke's aphasia. All right, so the face. So face, arm, speech. So face is affected. Why is the face affected? Well, we got the MCA territory right there, right? And the homunculus, if we lay it across the uh, MCA territory, it affects this portion right here, right? So it affects the what? The face. Right, so the face is not going to have motor sensation, and it's not going to have um, sensation. Sensation, right? So it's not able to. You're not able to move it, right? So if you can't move your face, your whole face is drooped, right? That's going to be. It's not going to sound uh, as articulate as you could, and also it's not, not able to feel that area as well, right? Just like maybe me this afternoon at four o'clock when I go to the dentist, or I'm not going to be able to feel my face on one side. And you're going to have things are going to drool out of your face. And what else is the risk that you, if you have a, uh, if you start to feed someone that with facial droop, they can choke, right? So stuff will fall out, but also their tongue doesn't work, right? So remember that they got a face here, but you also got the tongue involved. So the tongue is not able to uh, articulate words, right? So that's called what? If you can't articulate words, aphasia is not able to kind of say words, but articulate, like specifically, like you, you're going to try to say word, but you say would, right? That is because your tongue doesn't work, right? It can't hit the palate, can't hit the front of your teeth, right? There's all there's a whole science behind how to talk, right? So it's that's called dysarthria. You're unable to talk good, okay? So dysarthria can happen because, and it, because your tongue doesn't work, but the other risk is your tongue cannot manipulate food well and you can choke, right? And what's the fancy word for choke and with food going on the wrong, wrong pipe? It's called aspiration, right? So they can aspirate and they can develop a pneumonia from it. So aspiration pneumonia is a, higher comp, a high complication that can occur with stroke patients, right? So dysphagia means they cannot, not, not phagia as in, with an S, right? But dysphagia with a G means they cannot swallow good, right? So we have to do a dysphagia screen. So what's a dysphagia screen? That's a swallow eval, right? So we can do it as nurses, but also we have speech, speech language pathologists that will do it officially. And they will tell you, go ahead and add a liquid thickener into their, into their food, into their liquids, or make sure they have chopped food, make sure they have this, this certain consistency. They're the, they're the ones that are gonna be the official say about what to do. All right, and then arms. All right, so that's face, we talked about speech, what about arms, all right? So the arms don't um, don't work, the hands don't work good, that's the motor problem. That's called what? If, if your arm doesn't work, it's called motor failure, otherwise known as paresis, right? So you have paresis, is it contralateral or ipsilateral? It's contralateral, right? It started in this area right over here, right? And so that's the left side, and it's going to decussate right by the medulla, and it's gonna go down and exit the spinal cord where it needs to exit, right? To the arms. 
right? Well, it's actually not going to because you had an MCA stroke. But you're going to also get uh, neglect on one side, so we'll talk about that. And graphesthesia, that means you cannot feel when someone's writing on you, like if you have your, sp your spouse, your significant other, draw hearts in your hand all the time, like for Valentine's Day, right? You can't feel that. It's like, what are you drawing? I, I, can't, I can't tell. Did you draw something? Right? So that's called graphesthesia. They cannot feel that, right? Stereognosis means that you cannot uh, recognize what's, what your hands are touching. When I stick, stick my hands in my pocket right now, I can feel keys. And the reason I know their keys is because I have a memory of that, right? I have a memory of the, what they feel like and what they are. So I am able to understand that that is, that is keys without looking at it. I don't need visual information. I'm just based on the touch of my hand. And your hand has so much, uh, so many sensors on it. That's why it gets so much dedication of space on your, your hand to begin with, on your uh, homunculus to begin with. Okay. So face, arms, and speech. And the other thing is uh, vision loss. All right. So vision loss is an important uh, area that, that can be affected with a MCA stroke, right? So you have contralateral vision loss. So you're unable to see out of half of your visual fields. So it, vision is very complicated. We'll talk about, we have a whole lecture dedicated to vision in MedSearch 2, uh, but this is, you're basically, things crisscross like five, three to four different times before it even actually hits your occipital lobe in the back there. Right? It's like this side looks at that side, and then that side switches that side, and that side goes to that side. You just got to trust me that it's contralateral. Okay? So the opposite side of your visual fields get, get lost. All right? You're not able to see that side. So we get a, we only see half our, our visual fields. And then the, other, the interesting thing is that it's actually cropped in. That they don't realize they're missing half their visual field. They've, their brain has cropped into it. And so they've kind of taken this little, ch -ch -ch -ch, everybody cropped a photo on their phone? Yeah. All right, we crop in, and then now that's that's now the, the, your your view of the world, right? So you're missing half the world, okay? So you're missing half your face. Hello. Hello from the other side. <clears throat> All right, so that's an MCA stroke. MCA strokes are going to have contralateral, leg or arm paresis, which one? Not leg, yes, arm, right? So contralateral arm paresis, right? And they're gonna have what happened to their face? They're gonna have facial droop, right? And are they gonna be a swallow risk or a choking risk, choking hazard? Yes, all right, they need a speech evaluation. So we can do the first one, but then we need to have someone official come in and do, do an assessment as well, okay? So that's the, your, your uh, MCA stroke. So we'll do PCA stroke and we'll take a break before we get to the cranial nerves in the next slide. All right, so the PCA territory, the posterior cerebral artery. So your PCA is gonna feed the back half of your, your brain here, right? That occipital lobe, for instance, right? So here's the occipital lobe in the back half of the brain that's getting fed by the PCA. Also, the thalamus gets fed. Okay, but if our occipital lobe does not work, we cannot see good, right? Because that's our visual cortex. All of those uh, nerve impulses that from the optic nerve will arrive at the um, at the at the occipital lobe, and because that's failed, that's not you're going to see also contralateral hemino or contralateral vision loss. Okay, I didn't get to say it on the previous slide, but we can say it here it's called homonymous hemianopsia, right? Homonymous meaning the same. Right, homonymous, the same side, hemi, half anopsia of your vision can, is lost, right? Half of your vision is lost and half on the same side of both. So homonymous hemianopsia is the name for uh, MCA strokes, get it? And uh, what other kind of strokes? PCA strokes, okay? They're also gonna have neglect where they don't see, they get a cropped in version, vision of the world and their world looks like that now. It's half their visual fields. Okay, so they have contralateral vision loss and they have contralateral uh, homonymous hemianopsia. If it's a huge stroke, yes, you can lose like all of your sight, but usually it's the half the sight first. They'll lose depth perception because your occipital lobe is taking information and it's letting you know if something is from both eyes, if something is farther away or closer, right? So you lose the ability of depth perception or if you're a neurologist, stereopsis, right? And then we have deep nuclei. So the deep nuclei of the brain get, um, get fed by different vessels, some of those vessels being the, um, 
our PCA, our posterior cerebral artery. So the thalamus. So the thalamus is a big switchboard operator. Again, it's taking all these motor signals from the brain. All right, so taking all these motor signals from the brain and it's sending it down to the correct side and vice versa. It's taking all the sensory information and sending it up to the brain, right? So if that, air, that central operator is not put into the right area, if it just fails, like it's off for business, all that sensory information is gonna arrive and it's gonna stop, right? All the motor information is gonna arrive and stop, right? So if all the motor information stops from one side, that's gonna be hemiparesis, the whole half of the body, arms and legs are going to be affected, okay? So the thalamus is cause hemiparesis. Is it gonna be the same side or opposite side? It's gonna be opposite side, right? We have contralateral loss because the right side, right? If a right, right-sided PCA stroke up here, it's going to hit the thalamus, thalamus is going to break, right? Thalamus is closed for business. So that whole right side is done, right? Has whole hemiparesis and whole hemi anesthesia, right? And also it actually feels like, not, not that, it's, just, it's not a pleasant feeling of no pain. It's, it actually feels like your whole body is burning, which is not fun, right? So your whole half your body feels like it's burning when your thalamus goes offline, all right? So then your hippocampus, what's your hippocampus for? I forgot. Oh no, it's for memory, all right? So memory deficits. So they're unable to remember things good, all right? So the hippocampus is fed by the PCA. If you have a PCA stroke, they can have a deficit of memory, right? It could be temporary if we were able to get in there within four and a half hours and fix it, or it could be a permanent deficit they have to live with, right? And face recognition, like you wake up and then grandma comes downstairs, like, who are you guys? All right? That's not Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease takes a while right, three to five years to, at least to, to grow to that, to that point. That's someone who has a, a PCA stroke, right? So you're looking for acute focal deficits. So something that's sudden and it is specific or pacific, right? And then perseveration we mentioned, perseveration we mentioned, and perseveration we mentioned. And then also we have hallucinations. So hallucinations can also result from uh, our nuclei being effect, not fed correctly, okay? So this whole posterior occipital lobe, gets affected, but also the, ox the uh, thalamus gets lack of flow as well. And also there's some other deep nuclei like the hippocampus for memory, okay? And then our first cranial nerve before we take a break, first cranial nerve is our, not our first one, but our first one that's important is cranial nerve three. So cranial nerve three uh, starts at the midbrain. And where's your midbrain at? So you have two bumps on your, on your brainstem, right? Two humps, right? So it depends which way you're going. Let's go from the spinal cord, or let's go from, the, I don't know which way. You got one hump and we got a second hump, right? The first hump is the pons, right? We got the pons here. The second hump is your medulla. Obviously it's worse if your medulla is affected, right? But just above the pons is your uh, midbrain. So your midbrain is where your cranial three comes from. Your midbrain is what the PCA feeds. The post cerebral artery, feeds the midbrain right in this little area right here, right? The midbrain, if you imagine, you put the, the, you like took off like a lollipop, you took off the, uh, and you left with a stick, the stick being your midbrain, pons, and medulla, and you put the lollipop back in place, I guess, right? You go by those cheaper lollipops, right? And it goes right back in place. That would be like your whole cerebrum and cerebellum you're reattaching, right? But if you take off that cerebrum and cerebellum, you're left with the midbrain pons medulla, right? And important stuff goes on there. One of the important things is cranial nerve three. Cranial nerve three is called the oculomotor nerve, right? So the oculomotor nerve is for oculomotor, for motoring the oculo, right? It's for moving the eye. So it moves the eye in many, many directions. There are two other nerves. So three, four, and six, sorry, three, yeah, three, four, and six are responsible for um, moving the eye. And only cranial nerve six is for this one, for that muscle, only the cranial four is for that muscle, and everything else is by the oculomotor nerve. That's how it got its name. So it's moving your eye around. The other thing that it does is pupil constrict, right? So if they have a deficit of that cranial nerve, that pupil is going to constrict or dilate. It's going to dilate because the nerve doesn't work anymore, right? And it's going to work on the same side or opposite side. the same side, because remember we said it decussates at the medulla, right? And it, did it have a chance to decussate? No, it came from right here and it went straight to the eyeball, okay? So this patient has a stroke on what side of the brain? They look towards the stroke, 
the pupils dilated on the same side and it is looking towards the same side because those muscles don't work. Those muscles can't keep it midline, right? And they're probably going to complain of blurry vision too because they're, now their eyeballs are not lined up. But that's a what side stroke? That's a left MC, the left PCA, ACA, or MCA? PCA stroke. So the left side, that whole side is has hemiphoresis on the contralateral ribs lateral side. So they have hemiphoresis on the contralateral side and cranial three on the ips lateral side is not working, right? Is so they look towards a stroke. So you would think of P, you just kind of turn it on your side here, that is the eyeballs, right? So the eyeballs get affected and also whole the whole half of the body, top and bottom gets affected when you have a PCA stroke. Okay? So this guy's stroke is where? Where is this guy's stroke at? It's on the right side, right? So he, has, he looks towards the right because his oculomotor nerve, his cranial 3 is not working. And then he has hemiphresis on the left side. So he has a right PCA stroke. Okay? So that's PCA stroke. Oh, that's my fault. I don't know why that's, that's plain. But this is an example of agonal breathing. All right? So this what? agonal breathing. So we're talking about the basal artery strokes. So in basal artery strokes, one of the things the basal artery feeds is the medulla, right? So your medulla does not get the blood flow it needs, whether it be ischemic or hemorrhagic. And then you have agonal breathing. That's the worst case scenario. Well, it's not worst case. Worst case is not breathing, which is what's, what agonal breathing proceeds. Agonal breathing happens first. You take these big, deep breaths, and then they stop breathing, right? So that's an example of a symptom of basal artery strokes. Yeah, and they can be dying of a stroke. All right, hurry up and die. All right, still agonal breathing. All right, so agonal breathing is, again, an example of a basal artery stroke. You can have respiratory variations. This is chain Stokes breathing. Hopefully it stops at this point, otherwise I have to pause this and figure out what's going on. So chain Stokes breathing is another abnormal breathing pattern with basal artery strokes. Okay, didn't play the whole video, it's my fault. I gotta figure out why that's played at the beginning of the slide and ran randomly. But chain Stokes breathing, if we click on that again, shows they breathe very, very slow, then faster, then faster, then faster, and faster, then slower, 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 a crescendo, decrescendo pattern, if you will, right? And then they stop breathing for a period of time, and then they then slowly breathe up again and more again, until they have, and they have this pattern of breathing. And there's different patterns of breathing out there, a different kind of neuro breathing that happens when your pons or your medulla gets affected. The pons and the medulla are responsible for you breathing in one second in, two seconds out, one second in, two seconds out, right? You don't think about that. You can adjust it, but that is what your pons and medulla are doing. They're changing the rate of depth and making you breathe deeper or, not, or more shallow. That's the job of your pons and medulla, which are part of your brainstem, right? Your brainstem is fed by the basal artery, right? The basal artery also takes a detour out to the um, cerebellum, little uh, scrotum beneath the, the cerebrum, right? That is responsible for what again? Balance and coordination. So they have a abnormal gait. So, oh shoot, gait. There's two different strokes that cause gait problems, right? One causes unable to walk and a, a gait that's not, not functional, right? The other one causes someone that looks drunk, right? So the, the one that causes them to be drunk would be a basal artery stroke versus a not able to walk on, one, on the contralateral side. What, what kind of stroke was that? An ACA stroke, right? So the basal artery is fed by the vertebral arteries. So we mentioned that your brain gets two blood supplies, right? It gets one from the carotids that we expect, and it gets one through the vertebral arteries in the back there. Those vertebral arteries will then feed into the, right back here, right? They'll feed into the circular willis. Before you hit the circular willis, though, we have the basal arteries, right? Our basal arteries are right in, oh, I changed colors, right in there. And if you lay them across the brainstem, it's feeding really important stuff, like we mentioned the medulla, right? Also, the top of that, that brainstem is the midbrain. And cranial three kind of overlaps. We talk about cranial three for uh, what kind of strokes? 
the previous slide kind of strokes, for PCA strokes, and for basilar artery strokes. So basilar artery is going to take it all the way to 12, right? It's going to 3 through 12, all the cranial nerves, right? You may remember the mnemonic from your uh, anatomy class, right? Was it some say marry money, but my big brother says big brains matter more. So that is a mnemonic to know all the different uh, cranial nerves, but now we're going to talk about their functions. Because if you don't know their, what their functions are at baseline, it's going to be hard to know what their dysfunction is because that's what we're talking about with stroke. That, doesn't, that cranial nerve doesn't work anymore. Or in multiple sclerosis, you get a damage to, the, to that cranial nerve 3, for instance, right? Or cranial nerve 7, for instance, it gets damaged. So that's, a, that's the idea behind knowing the cranial nerves, right? Cranial nerve 3, 4, and 6 we mentioned were responsible for EOM, which is elect, uh, electronic dance, not festival. No, it's uh, <laughs> extraocular eye movement, right? EOM is where you are moving your eyes in all directions, right? You're able to move your eyes up, down, left, right. They have, may have a gaze deviation if they have a basilar artery stroke or a PCA stroke. That will affect their muscles and their eyes off to the side. If your eyes off to the side, can you see good? You're going to get two different visions, two different things inputting into your brain, and you'll get diplopia. So diplopia is an example of cranial 3 dysfunction or cranial 3, 4, 6 dysfunction. All right, 3, 4, and 6 are all kind of encapsulated. So diplopia is another fancy word for what? Scene two or double vision, right? So double vision is diplopia. That's a result of your cranial three, four, or six being affected, right? So the other next step is seven. So cranial seven is your facial nerve. So your facial nerve feeds your face, right? It's for sensory and motor function. So your you have sensation in your face is, is bad, or you can't your face doesn't work good, right? So you're you have facial drooping a little bit, but also you have what's called ptosis with a silent p. Right, P-T-O-S-I-S, ptosis or ptosis is where you have a, your whole eye, your whole eyelids are drooping over your eye, iris, right? So it's covering your eye a little bit. And we'll talk about ptosis with uh, myasthenia gravis. So that's why we're kind of touch based on here. And we're going to copy and paste this every single disease process going forward, right? Because every single disease process pretty much is going to be affecting the, these things. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's not so much, but the other guys do. All right, so three, four, and six are for what? Your extraocular eye movement, and when they fail, you get diplopia, right? So we're gonna copy and paste this little purple box here to the appropriate slides when we have, oh, it has cranial nerve weakness, cranial nerve problems. Those are the symptoms we get, right? And that's called ocular bulbar, right? Or ocular bulbosaur. No, ocular bulbar uh, weakness is when you have oculo, right? That's going to be the, the cranial nerve two sometimes involved, but really it's three, four, and six, and three. So oculo meaning your eyeballs don't work good, so you get diplopia. Are they a fall risk? Yes, they're a fall risk. They can't see good, right? And then we talk about seven. They got ptosis. We'll see that especially with certain disease processes. And then we have kind of eight. Eight is the vestibulocochlear nerve. It has two, two responsibilities, to vestibulo and to cochleo. What, is, what, are those, what does that mean? The vestibulum is what? Where's the vestibule in your body? In your ear. It's what's for balance and coordination. But also, if that's not working, A, you're not balanced, so you're a fall risk. But also, B, you're going to get vertigo. Right, your vertigo is going to—they're going to—they're going to get up, and then that cranial doesn't work. It cannot coordinate things and make sure you are—you are, you are uh, operating efficiently. Right. So then also the other part, the uh, cochlea, that's where you hear. Right. So you have hearing issues, or you have a um, tinnitus that might occur. Tinnitus is ringing in the ears. All right, and then cranial nine and ten. Nine is your uh, was it your hypoglossal, right? I was to say up there. Your nine is your. I get I get hypoglossal and pharyngeal. What's it, what's what it called? It's glossopharyngeal. Glossopharyngeal. Hypoglossal glossopharyngeal control the tongue, but uh, that because they close the control the tongue, you're going to get what symptom? Your tongue doesn't work good. Therefore, you get what symptom? Dysarthria and dysphagia. All right. So you get both because your tongue is responsible for swallowing and your tongue is responsible for articulating, right? So you can't articulate well and you cannot swallow well, right? So that is a symptom of cranial nerve 9. Cranial nerve 10 is responsible for your gag reflex. So the gag reflex is your ability to, to 
uh, sense things in the back of your throat. Often people's gag reflex is impaired not because of practice, but there's also, you know, there's sword swallowers out there. So there's the, that, that's not always an accurate way to assess um, cranial nerves, but they can have gag and swallowing can be impaired. Speech will be uh, funny. It won't be, it'll be like, they call it uh, dysphonia. There's like a nasal quality to it. Okay. And then also cranial 9 and 10 are actually a part of our, um, our baroreceptors. Our baroreceptors are, they, they take a hike on cranial nerve 10 up to, the, um, up to the brain. And the carotid bodies, which receive blood pressure and O2 sense, they take information up to the brain as well via the, the uh, hypoglossal nerve. It's like you can't say hypoglossal, glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay, so those are 9 and 10. And then we've got, what, 11 and 12? So 12 is also your tongue doesn't work good and might not taste well, but basically you're, this, the, the big symptom that we're worried about is dysarthria and dysphagia. They can't talk good, which is you know a problem. That's, there's some psychosocial needs that we had to address, but the more you know, physiological problem is they can't swallow good. They can choke and aspirate, and that's something we have to be alert to. Current number 11, they got a weak neck. So their neck is not able to, you know, they're not able to move their hot, um, shrug their shoulders or they might have be able to, you know, they might get fatigued throughout the day. Okay. So going from the top, cerebellar is for balance. Uh, pons is for respiratory stuff. So is medulla. And the medulla controls, it sends the signal out via your sympathetic and your parasympathetic to control the heart rate. So now you're going to have heart rate problems, right? You're going to start having like sinus pauses and other bad stuff. Okay, they go to Brady asystole, or they go agonal apneic when you have the medulla not getting its blood supply. All right, and then the brainstem infarct. So the brainstem can also, you know, everything else can uh, get infarct infarcted, but then you just have one little small area that works. And just basically everything gets shut down. You have quadriparesis. The, all four extremities are flaccid. All four extremities don't sense, but the patient is locked in. It's extremely rare. It makes for really good Hollywood movies where they had, you know, they can hear and see everything, but they are, they cannot breathe on their own. They cannot do anything on their own. They have to be on life support for that. And then the reticular activating system with 1A, not 2As, that's the RAS, right? This is the reticular activating system. It's what keeps you awake. It runs up and down the brainstem there, and it's what keeps you alert, like benzodiazepines and opiates suppress it so you don't stay awake. They have their respiratory depressants because they inhibit the RAS, all right? The reticular activating system, I should say. So when you have a basal artery stroke, they might present comatose to the hospital. These are the most serious kind of strokes. That's why it's in red, okay? It's also where BE comes from. BE was added to FAST because it didn't capture posterior strokes. So PCA strokes and basal artery strokes were left out in the dust. So we added B and E to it. So we can assess balance, which is which, which uh, area? Cerebellum and eye stuff, right? Yeah, eye stuff for PCA is they can't, you know, their eyes might be double vision because they're not, they have a gaze deviation or they have homonymous hemianopsia or you have a, um, the same thing here with your, your ocular bulbar dysfunction, right? So if we take the pons and we kind of turn it on its side here, and you kind of turn it around, we're going to see the front half. We have the cranial three up top there, and it goes all the way down to 12, right? And this ocular bulbar uh, region right here is going to be affected in our other neuro disorders, like myasthenia gravis, for instance, It's our neuromuscular junctions don't work. So it's not necessarily the ocular bulbar that's dysfunctioning, but those nerves will then arrive at a muscle, and the muscle doesn't work, right? So you get ocular bulbar dysfunction. Okay, so those are our cranial nerves are in our basal artery strokes. All right, so symptoms of CVAs is just based on the vessel. What vessel got occluded, occluded that is your stroke. So there's a little man right there. Look, at the M is spelling out the arms because M is MCA, and MCA strokes affect the contralateral or ipsilateral side. Look at the contralateral arms, and what else? Face, right? and also causes speech problems. So we got an M for a mustache. And then P for PCA, affects the eyes. A for ACA, because ACA is wet, wild, and wacky, right? And the, the point is that these focal deficits are sudden, and they are, um, they, they are focal. They are one specific thing is wrong. They are inconstant, or they are dysarthric, or they are choking on their food, or they're drooling out of their mouth because they have facial droop, right? 
So we have to know the last known time well. The last known time well is going to tell us if we can do certain treatments. All right. We can also do what's called a NIHSS, a National Institute of Health Stroke Scale. It's not something you have to know for the test. It just tells you this, this scale is done to assess how bad a stroke is from 0 to 42. It's like, why not 0 to 10? All right, 0 to 42. Tell me how bad your stroke is, right? So the worse off you are, uh, the more severe stroke you have when they have a higher number. And basically, you're assessing their strength, right? Raise your arms, and if one starts drifting, that one is weak, right? And raise your legs next. If one starts drifting, that is weak. And also we get little pins and needles out and we poke them with our calipers we bought in first semester, right? We start poking their legs and say, hey, can you feel this side? No. Can you feel this side? Yes. So that side, the other side is the deficit, right? And if it's the legs, what vessel was occluded? It was the ACA, okay? So NIH stroke scale is a way to assess uh, how bad someone's stroke, stroke is, okay? And also kind of guides whether we are going to give um, thrombolytics. All right, thrombolytics are going to bust the clot open and break apart the clot, but if they have a really, really bad stroke, it might, it, they actually, the, the, the risks don't outweigh the benefits in that, in that spot. They have to meet a sweet spot for, for thrombolytics. All right, there are, uh, what's the word, mimics to strokes. As we mentioned, a blood sugar is an important mimic that could mimic a stroke. If someone has ETOH, Right? or they have alcohol on board, they're going to have an impaired gait, right? they have double vision. So that is, so how do we know someone has alcohol? You can smell it. You can do an alcohol level, too. You can measure someone's alcohol level. And remember, strokes are sudden and onset. When someone has like an aura of a headache and they have all these things, oh, no, I'm having a stroke. It's like, no, usually strokes are like, bam, right away. You have, it, you have this, these symptoms. Same thing like uh, infectious, right? If they have a, like a, a brain abscess could be growing, they're going to have a fever. Strokes don't have a fever. This is not an inflammatory process, right? Intoxication we mentioned, infection, right? A meningitis of some sort. Usually, like meningitis, is, is, you get confused and altered, but it's going to have a fever with it, okay? So last known time well is important because that's going to decide whether we are going to give thrombolytics or not. BFAST will help you decide uh, well, is a quick thing we can teach patients to, and families to identify if someone is having a stroke. Okay, so diagnostic tests are important because it decides whether we have a hemorrhage.